Good afternoon and welcome to our second uh, installment of Conversations in Christian Muslim Dialogue, uh, which is funded through the Henry Luce Foundation as part of the Christian Muslim Studies Network. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Mona Siddiqui with me. Uh, and we're gonna have a wide ranging conversation about her work, what drew her into Christian Muslim Studies, as well as her forthcoming book, which came out of her Gifford lectures at the University of Aberdeen. Um, just as a reminder, if you weren't here two weeks ago, there is a comment button uh, both on Facebook and on YouTube that you can ask your questions for and we can bring them up and we'll probably get to your questions about 20 minutes time. So if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to be uh, involved in the conversation, just add them into the comment box and we'll be able to see them. So welcome, uh, Mona. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. So for those of you who don't uh, know Professor Siddiqui, your original work was as a scholar of fiqh and Islamic law. What uh, brought you from that study into an engagement with Christian Muslim relations? So my PhD was on fiqh and looking at family law and just a very detailed account of a 16th century text, going through the text line by line as to what are the parameters of marriage, divorce, etc. Um, and I really enjoyed that because there aren't that many scholars who do fru, and a lot of scholars do usul, the principles of law, but not what does what do the text actually say. But as I was getting into that, um, I was drawn into a conversation that took place in sometime in 2001, 2002, um, where Lambeth Palace was having a, a big gathering. And really post... Uh, various things, including 9-11, um, these kind of conversations suddenly took sharp focus. And as I was sat there, it occurred to me, and I was there with about 40, 50 colleagues, some people I knew and some people I didn't know, um, that the Christian colleagues had a very different way of talking about faith and how it matters in life and, and, and linking their faith in Jesus, the way the world works, how they think of their own lives. Whereas most of my Muslim colleagues were really talking more about Islamic studies um, and what texts say. And that's really the first time I noticed there was a distinction between how communities talked about, at that time, what their faith means to them and why it matters. And I thought, if I'm going to engage in this, I found it really stimulating. I need to study this more. I need to study not what dialogue is or what interfaith is, but how do I go about even studying Christian theology or looking at Christian theology? Because it was only through that angle that I started thinking about, well, how do I do Islamic theology? How do I think about it beyond the discipline of this is fiqh and this is falsafa and this is anything else? And that's really how I got drawn in, because I found listening to the Christian colleagues over the ne period of next 10, 11 years, um, and especially those who were interested in being part of an interreligious setting, really stimulating for what I didn't know and what I did know and how so many things are so different, but even though we're thinking we're speaking the same language. So do you think some of that has to do with the differences, especially in the early 2000s, where Christian theology, especially in the UK, still had or still has more of a sense of uh, writing from a normative or at times confessional uh, standard, while Islamic studies was often put into area studies or historical studies, uh, and there wasn't, and still maybe remains the case where there's not as much space for Muslim intellectuals to speak both as academics, but also out of their own uh, traditions. It's really hard to um, define what Islamic theology means today, because when you look at classical writers, it's all confessional. Even the philosophers are largely confessional. We think of confessional as a critique in the academy. We think of it as something that you don't do. But for me, the interest was not so much Christian theology, which was basically repeating the same things I'd, I'd heard and read and, and seen. But it was more about how does what you believe in or how does your reading affect the way you think about your life today? So for me, it wasn't so much transcendent truth so as much as, well, if I think this is the right way to live, or if I think this is part of the Islamic tradition broadly, how does that affect my thinking today? Whether that's confessional or not, I'm not sure, 
yeah. obviously as a Muslim, I am trying to think within that context, but I'm also trying to think, well, what does it mean for me to, to think about this in a way that is part of modernity, but still looking at the tradition and what other people have said. So there is a change that happens along the way. In a way, we're kind of, at the time, it was very new territory because people weren't thinking theologically. And I do remember a colleague, an American colleague saying to me, you don't have the luxury of just doing Islamic studies in a traditional sense, which is keeping yourself detached or immersing yourself so much that you just sound like somebody who's just saying Islam is great. You have to think about it ethically. Really, what does our faith demand from us today? And what does it mean to be Muslim or Christian? So that has drawn you into a variety of, of works, both in terms of your public uh, engagement mm -hmm. with the BBC and other places, but also academically uh, in engaging uh, specifically with the question of Jesus. Um, and you chose uh, to write your first longer book on Christian Muslim relations on this figure of Jesus. What brought you to looking at uh, Jesus as the first sort of starting point for your broader work in Christian Muslim relations? Because it seemed to me that unless we looked at the very issue of who Jesus is for Christians and or who, or who and what does Jesus mean in Islam, and then the whole complexity of Christology from all its perspectives in, in, in the Christian faith, we would just carry on repeating the same mantras that Jesus is a prophet and we revere him in his Islamic tradition. And that doesn't really cut it with most Christians because... What does that say that's of any meaning to most Christians for whom Jesus is not just a prophet? So really for me, the most interesting aspect of Christian Muslim at the time was this whole area of Christology. Because without faith in Jesus, there is no Christianity, but Jesus is optional in Islam. You know, you can, you can say, yes, we have to believe in all the prophets, but he's not essential to Islamic shahada or belief, irrespective of the fact that people say we believe in all the prophets. Of course you say that, but he's not the pivot around which Islam is shaped. And then the more I got into it, then, then I realized things like, how does one even think of prophecy? How does one think of spirit? How does one think of salvation? And most importantly, bringing together my previous discipline, how does one think of love, love and law? And that really led to so many wider discussions that bring about a kind of, interesting angle to Christian and Muslim relations, but also brings to fore the diversity of thinking around it and the distinctions in how we even talk of law, how we even talk of love, how we even think about the vocabulary that we think binds us, but actually separates us, not in a kind of hostile way, but in terms of intellectual hermeneutics. Yeah, I think one of the, as you noted, one of the things that often happens in Christian Muslim dialogue or polemics even is the, the assertion we believe in uh, Jesus as a prophet, why can't you believe in Muhammad as a prophet, which often uh, papers over a lot of the significant differences uh, around Jesus, but the ways in which Jesus cracks open a whole host of other debates, law, love, salvation, human nature. And I think one of the things that your book tries to do is to look at the ways in which Christology is both a touchstone uh, between Christian Muslims uh, Christians and Muslims, but also opens up to a whole wide variety of, of issues. I mean, yeah. I, if I recall correctly, you know, you talk about it as the most interesting in part because it touches on these neurological uh, differences, which I think leads into some of the ways both you and I approach Christian Muslim relations, which is not to be so quick in seeking out commonality or agreement just in the name of uh, interfaith relations, but using those touchstones as ways to explore in much more depth and nuance uh, how engaging with Islam in my case or Christianity in your case might help us rethink our own traditions and our own scholarship. Yes, and I don't see, I mean, I think on the one hand, interreligious studies, where you call, whether you call it comparative theology or whatever, is still not systematic. We Most of us are doing what we think is of interest to us. But I don't see that as a, a problem. Um, I mean, all academic work or in, all intellectual work should stimulate not just the writer, but also the reader into rethinking things. You know, what is the point of scholarship if all you read is what affirms your 
your opinions. So for me, it was never about if I read this, then I can convince Christians of X, Y, and Z. It was more about, oh, this is really interesting. I'd never thought of this as like this. So how does that make me think about what I know about my own tradition? And actually, if you go back to the classical world of Islam, so many of the themes that you and I are touching were touched then. They, they, just, they sort of disappeared post-colonial, in the post-colonial era. But really, because at that time, Islam was very much the other in a sense of, yes, we colonize and we go and, and do mission, but this is really a religion that's so distinct. Whereas if you look at 11th, 12th, 13th century writings, whether they're in uh, theology or philosophy, there is so much more engagement between Muslims and Christians in all kinds of areas, in a way that we don't really have anymore. And part of, I think, what you and I are trying to do, and I think, you know, to some extent, others are now coming on board, is to revive those conversations for the sake of an intellectual conversation, not for commonality, not for conversion, not for come to my way of thinking, but just that if you don't engage with things that you are not aware of or don't understand well, how do you grow as a scholar? How do you grow as a thinker or as a person? Yeah, I think one of the things both, uh, it was the case in the Eastern Mediterranean, and of course, in the classical period, but uh, Najib Awad, uh, who's a Syrian Christian, just sent me an article where he's talking about, it's not dialogue uh, where you're going out to seek someone else. It's already the terrain of encounter for most uh, people in the Middle East. Uh, and I think that's often the case now for, for us and for others where it's just a natural engagement that you're you are reflecting on questions of God, of truth, of method, of what is it, what is the public Absolutely. good, um, and that brings you into this this so-called dialogical encounter. But yeah. so much of the work in the um, the twentieth century has been sort of often somewhat artificial, where one has to seek out dialogue. Um, and one of the things that I think we're trying to to show is the ways that it's already present in our work, whether we yeah. are aware of it or not. Um, in terms of your 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 book on Jesus, you've said you know some ways in which the Christian tradition has made you to think differently. What are some examples of that? Um, whether it's from that book or we'll get into mm -hmm. your 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 current work. Um, I think the first word or concept was really salvation, and that was only because I was in a BBC setting, and it was a kind of uh, blue sky thinking. It was years ago, and the person chairing the committee said well, you know, we should be thinking about words like how important salvation is to Muslims and to Christians. And uh, the word of God is, and I thought, does he even know what that means in terms of what Muslims think and what's important? And that's really one of the first concepts, mainly because it's not that people don't think of salvation, but the whole issue, premise of salvation, the whole premise of having faith in a being for salvation is not really there in Islam. I mean, it, it grew in Islam in terms of, but it's not as essential. Salvation is not, you know, the translation of salvation is very difficult. And I would say the nearest we come to is falah, which means success, success in life, which leads you to God. So these are, I mean, salvation was one of the first words, but I also think things like love and, and what does law mean are extremely interesting ways of thinking about when somebody says to me, uh, Muslims only discuss law, they're obsessed with Sharia. And if I then say, well, what does it mean to, what does Christian ethics mean? What is it based on? You can have a really interesting conversation because on the one hand, Sharia is, can be all about, it can be reduced to rules and regulations. Whereas Christian ethics becomes this vast canvas on which you can really paint anything if you say that it's based on a life in Jesus. And between those two almost extremes, I think, you then start to think, well, what do those parameters actually mean? And now they may mean very similar things at the end in terms of our ethics, but the way you enter those two conversations, that conversation are from very different angles. Yeah, I mean, that touches on, on an aspect of my own work, uh, which is this fundamental debate about law and I think one of the things that's really been challenging to me with engaging with Islamic uh, critiques of Christian views of law is this demand for engagement with particularities and the ways in which law is about cases, about judgments, about particularities in the ways that often Christian ethics involves a very uh, 
large standing and often idealistic appeal to things like justice, equality, love. I want to affirm all of those things, but I think one of the critiques that Fazal Rahman makes, for instance, of Kenneth Cragg's, um, Kenneth Cragg was a, a famous uh, British scholar of Islam and Christian Muslim relations, and he criticizes Muhammad when he turns to Medina as giving up his religious message uh, for the sake of his political message. Uh, but Fazal Rahman uh, makes, I think, a really strong mm -hmm. Uh, critique of him and of Christian ethics more broadly, which is to say, if you want to be engaged in questions of justice in this world, you have to make uh, fundamental decisions about particular issues. How do you feed the poor? Uh, how do you deal with inheritance rights? Um, how do we deal with uh, questions? Uh, I mean, this touches on the very issues as an American that we're facing today. It's not a ge general appeal to ethics or justice that we need, but concrete decisions about 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 the police, about um, ethical injustice. It's not enough to just say, you know, all lives matter. It's a particular issue yeah. of of uh, social injustice towards towards Black Americans that we're trying to address. And I think that sort of critique yeah. in which Christian ethics can can separate is is a real important aspect that can be evaded if we just talk about love and law in the abstract. I think if, if, if I mean, Rahman also said something, I'm paraphrasing, that if God is, transcend, is our transcendent anchoring point of all our moral values, then we need to constantly return to God, but also think about God in, in real terms, not just in abstracts. So I, I do think to some extent that Sharia can, can be reduced simply because there is so much material on Sharia to rules and regulations where you're not thinking about the ethical dimension, you're thinking about the parameters of what you can and can't do, um, which is almost, well, it's slightly different from just dealing with law and abstracts as well. But I but I would also argue that people like Fazl Rahman and Muhammad al -Kun also talk about, the and as actually Khalid Abdul Fadl as well, that talking about law on its own is not enough, you have to talk about ethics. Because ethics was largely subsumed under law for so much of Islamic history. Law is not ethics though. Um, so in a way, we're, we need to be grappling with a new way of thinking about law, which is how does one talk about Sharia in an ethical framework, not just in an illegal framework. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point. And, and the ways in which uh, to affirm and, and to engage with questions of Sharia and fail uh, as more than just these stereotypes that often Christians or others have, uh, but also to allow for engagement and critique. I know that uh, Nasser Arif, a uh, Egyptian uh, philosopher uh, at our conference that we had in Beirut made a similar argument, not about ethics, but about, about politics, that sort of political philosophy in the Islamic tradition, at least the Sunni one, got subsumed under legal tradition and there was no broader questions uh, allowed to be asked and so i think one of the dialogical possibilities that we're trying to look at is how can there be mutual critique and mutual learning beyond just these simplistic tropes yeah um, and i think on, on that point i mean hopefully what we're trying to do and neither you and i are of that persuasion is to not allow people to ask questions on the basis that either of us has an agenda that the real intellectual learning happens when you are open and free to ask a question, not because you want to have a go at a tradition or a person, but simply because you want to challenge them and say, well, I don't understand this, or how does this work? And that is actually far more rare than we realize, because this is still very, not dangerous territory, but this is kind of nervous territory for a lot of people. Yeah, I think you you enact that extremely well in the final chapter of the book on Jesus, where you're reflecting on the cross and allowing both the Christian tradition, but also your colleagues and the aesthetic experience of the cross to sort of uh, push against uh, some of your own uh, mm -hmm. tradition. Can you say a little bit about that chapter and um, what you think? Obviously, the cross is a major issue uh, oh, that divides Christians and Muslims not only in its historicity, but more importantly, in its uh, its its centrality for the Christian tradition. It was interesting because when I got to that chapter, I asked some of my colleagues, and at the time, obviously, they were all Christian colleagues, um, 
And I did say to them, what does a cross mean to you? And it was surprising the number, the variety of responses I got from people saying, well, it's, I have a little small cross on my desk. I don't really look at it, but it always lies there to giving kind of very extensive and elaborate descriptions of what the crucifixion and the cross means to them. Um, but for me, it was really, how do I think about the cross, not in an intellectual way, but not even thinking about the crucifixion, but just in terms of what the cross means as a central um, point in the life of Christians, not just in a church, but in the way they think about their faith in Christianity. So I did go, I mean, I asked various people about which church should I go in, which cathedral. In the end, I, I just went to a local church. Um, and I found the whole experience very moving. I suppose when you're sitting there, almost bearing yourself to whatever you feel you will accept, um, it's a risk in the sense of, it's an emotional risk, it's not just an intellectual risk, because you don't know how you might come out the other end. Um, so you've done all the writing, you've done all the kind of intellectual putting the thing together. But then you think, well, I really need to know how it feels to gaze at the cross. And I, how can I even get some semblance of what it means for, you know, true believing Christians? What does a cross mean, mean to them? But then I think if you don't have the courage to do that, then... In some ways, for me personally, I won't say everyone, but for me personally, I got to a point where it was essential for me to do that. Um, and it was a very um, moving experience. I can, that's all I can really say, in the sense that I came away thinking that really at the end of the day, all the theological discussions around the cross and the crucifixion and the Trinity and the divinity of Jesus kind of collapse on this one symbol and if that symbol draws me in so be it if the symbol doesn't draw me in but still moves me that's fine as well and so, so yeah yeah i mean you you conclude by saying that there's a, a certain beauty or i don't know if attraction is the right word but mm -hmm. that it also doesn't seem necessary or needed that god's transcendence and mercy uh is communicated in a way in the Islamic tradition that um, makes the cross um, not, I mean, I guess in some ways not necessary and, and maybe not even fitting to use some Christian terms. Um, so there's this uh, ability to engage it on its own terms, but also a recognition. Um, can you say a little bit about why as a, as a Muslim intellectual that you think God's mercy and transcendence um, is communicated in a way that makes the cross both uh, uh, draw uh, uh, understandable, but but something that I don't want to say reject in a in a yeah. negative way, but that you reject in some ways. Um, yeah, I think I suppose you can't think about the cross without thinking about the incarnation. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's it's very difficult to to, to think about God incarnate and when i look at the cross i don't just see suffering i also see the incarnation suffering or triumph whichever way your theology works and i think that f far more than the divinity of jesus the problem is how do i think of the humanity of god in that sense um so Although I feel God within me, I don't conceptualize God in any way. And I'm not saying that Christians conceptualize God, but you do have the incarnation. Mm -hmm. So for me, the, the separation of the cross from the incarnation is almost impossible. Um, so when I think of, when I look at the cross, I'm also thinking of the descent of God, which is just not there in Islam which was, you know, whatever case you make for divine light and everything, the incarnation in the Christian sense is not there in Islam. And I think it's also something you feel. I don't think it's something you can intellectualize. So a lot of Christians have said to me, well, of course, you know, don't start with the Trinity, it's too confusing, don't start with this. But they're still, they're still believers in every sense of the word. Because just because you can't intellectualize something doesn't mean you can't feel it. And so for me, the, the issue was, 
I can understand the intellectual aspect of this. I can even understand the kind of um, complete radical aspect of the descent of God. It's very attractive. I can understand it and I can understand what draws people to that. I can understand that God is love, for which is the essence of what Christians say. But God's humanity in that sense, in the incarnation, becomes a stumbling block for me. Yeah, which is uh, a great term, actually. I mean, it's from Paul in 1 Corinthians in, in the ways in which the cross is foolishness and a stumbling block, uh, both in terms of salvation, but also in, in as you're saying, the sense of um, it's not simply the crucifixion of a human being, which sadly is something that we can resonate with across history, but it's the crucifixion of this one who is identified with God that becomes uh, for for a certain strand of the Christian tradition, the, the key of salvation. Yeah. Um, I, I'm aware uh, we're about 25 minutes in. If anyone has any questions before we are, we turn to um, talking a little bit about Mona's forthcoming book and her Gifford lectures, which um, uh, we'll talk about. So if you have any questions or comments about what we've been talking about thus far, or want to have more clarity, you can just put it in the comments section. Um, as we wait for that, just to to ask you, you were uh, you gave the Gifford lectures a few years back at the University of Aberdeen, one mm -hmm. of the most uh, well, we one of the most prestigious, uh, if not the most prestigious, lecture series in the English language. Uh, and what was the theme of of this study? So I was going to do it in a comparative context, and I thought I would do it on the notion of struggle, human struggle partly because I didn't want to do anything theoretical. I wanted to do something that, you know, struggle is not theory. Struggle is what people talk about in real life. Um, so, and I decided that I would look at um, philosophical, theological works on struggle, um, sociological uh, works on struggle. What does it mean to talk of struggle in, in, in contemporary life? But that the middle chapters would be looking at comparing a Muslim and a Christian writer or thinker or theologian. Um, there's no system to my thinking here. It was just people that I'd enjoyed reading, people I thought still um, are kind of legends almost in each tradition. Um, and that they, people will never stop reading these guys. Um, so I paired uh, scholars together and looked at, the, the rationale for pairing them was, one or two things that they both had in common. Um, and then how did they deal with their own struggle at the particular time that I was looking at them? So what was a really exciting thing in my head became almost impossible to write, basically, let me put it that way. But yeah, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from close reading when I came to writing the, the, the lectures up for the publication of Ghazali, of Bonhoeffer, of Rilke, um, and and just understanding that actually until you read things very closely, you just repeat the same stuff, even about legends, you know, about people that you think, well, what more is there to say? And um, I think the most challenging chapter for me to write on the struggle was the struggle of Bonhoeffer and the, study, the struggle for Said Qutb. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly gonna be an interesting uh, chapter that one is comparing uh, Said Qutb, who's often thought of, uh, especially outside of the Islamic tradition and even within the Islamic mm -hmm. tradition as something of a of a radical with Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who's often um, venerated even by those traditions that don't have saints. Um, you use their, their experience as prisoners as sort of a link to look at their struggle. Um, how does prison unite uh, Bonhoeffer and, and Qutb? So both wrote while they were in prison. And um, so I, I, I look at the selection of their writings, not just uh, milestones for Qutub and um, letters from a prison for um, Bonhoeffer, but I wanted to see how a Christian and a Muslim from very different backgrounds, bearing in mind they were both born in the same year, um, very different experiences talked about their struggle while they were in prison. And in the end, I mean, you know, as, as most people know, 
For Qutb, the problem was that Muslims had stopped being Muslims. And we can talk endlessly about Jahiliya, we don't have time. But for him, the, the Muslims had stopped being Muslims and that Sharia was the answer. Whatever you mean by Sharia, however Sharia is actually realized, Sharia was the answer. And for Bonhoeffer, Christians have ceased to be Christians in the way that he thought they should be Christians in the rise of Nazism and the Christian, the, the church's reluctance for, for a large part of that time to condemn Nazism. And so in a way they're both, and for him, faith in, in Jesus Christ, and what does it mean to have faith and what does it cost to have faith, meant that both were committed to a cause. Both came to that cause probably from very different angles. Obviously, when you when you look at Bonhoeffer's letters from a prison, he he there's so much joy still there. There's a lot of melancholy, there's a lot of sadness, but still there's a lot of joy. Whereas Qutub's writings are very much everything is going bad for Muslims. Unless Muslims wake up, you know, we're doomed basically. Islam is not theory, he would argue. Islam is a way of life, and the Sharia is the very essence of Islam. So in a way, both of them politicized, being, became political figures because they had to politicize the very thing that they believed in. Yeah. Otherwise, it wasn't going to work. And, and I mean, uh, I'm fascinated and can't wait to read the chapter when the book comes out with Cambridge later this year or early next. Uh, but there's also this fact that both Bonhoeffer and uh, and Kudup are resisting against uh, a, a, a leader that they view as corrupt they both are writing in prison in a way that is talking about how do we reimagine Christianity or Islam after the ruins of, in their case, Nazi Germany or Nasser and what he thinks of as the decline of, of Muslims. And so there is this point of contact, but but I have to imagine that some of the questions during the Gifford uh, lectures or maybe some of your in external reviews weren't so happy with uh, Bonhoeffer being compared to Kudab. And I think that um, the very fact that it's even cleared the review um, <laughs> by the same person who's not very happy, he said he's now finally convinced that, but he said a lot of Christians will still not be happy with putting the two together. Now, again, I wasn't putting the two together to say that Qutub isn't this ideologue or Bonhoeffer is some ideologue. It wasn't so much that. It was how did two people who had similar experience of prison for their writings what did they write about while they were suffering in prison? That was really my angle. It wasn't to say one is better than the other, or why should I compare somebody who has been um, accused of inspiring 9-11 to somebody who basically well, died for a much higher cause? It, the agenda, that is not the agenda. The agenda is, what did I learn from reading Bonhoeffer's writings from prison in a way that I haven't read by a Muslim who has been imprisoned. Um, so, and I think also, you know, the, the review, the, the reviewer also said that I had made Qutub, I had I, I'd approached Qutub from a very revisionist angle. Now, my only argument in Qutub is that a lot of the things that Qutub is saying actually in Milestones are not that radical. When he says Sharia should be the source of all our lives, we should have, a lot of Muslims say that. They don't, may not know what that means, but they say that. When he says, oh, you know, Muslims are no longer Muslims anymore, a lot of Muslims say that. I don't necessarily think they mean anything political by it, but this is very common parlance for a lot of people. So it wasn't so much that, you know, was he stirring up a revolution from inside prison or what else was he doing that was beyond just, just resisting Nasser? Because if, if, if when you think about it, both Bonhoeffer and Qutub were not anti-the state at the beginning. They became anti-state much later. It was really to see, well, actually, what is he saying beyond saying that we are living in a state of Jahiliya, where he's condemning Muslims for not living up to Sharia? Well, a lot of Muslims do that. I don't agree with them doing that, but they do do that all the time. Whether it's about modernity or whether it's about wanting to be more Salafi or whether it's about returning to the true Islam. There's always this narrative somewhere in Islamic societies that we need to be more Muslim, whatever that means. So the, the, the interesting thing for me really is only the point of comparison, two people 
imprisoned for their views on the state. Not to say that Bonhoeffer is not a saint. I mean, you know, that itself is disputed. But I think, you know, as a point of humor here, I hadn't realized that there was this whole cult of Bonhoeffer scholars, that if you step out of line, you could be metaphorically shot. And I don't think I'll ever please them, but I haven't said anything there that I haven't read or learned. I haven't made up stuff about Bonhoeffer. I'm just trying to work through his writings to say, this is why he becomes such an enigmatic figure, perhaps more enigmatic than he needs to be, but he is still enigmatic. Which I think is indicative of, of your approach, of our approach at Edinburgh to thinking about Christian Muslim relations, that it's not just about trying to find solutions to these um, ethical issues or to the question about God, but to actually find ways of saying, when we engage, when we read comparatively, when we read dialogically, what new insights or opportunities that open up? And it may not even lead necessarily always to a solution. Uh, that no. in terms of... Uh, we've That's got a why couple. important that you point that out, Joshua, because it isn't about here is my agenda and here is the end result of it. Everything that I'm thinking about, I'm hoping that this will open up a conversation. Yep. But what you and I are doing in some ways is it's quite demanding for a lot of scholars because they don't, whether it's nerves or whether it's, I don't know, whether it's some kind of intellectual apathy, there's still a sense amongst a lot of Muslim scholars as well as a lot of Christian scholars, I'm sure. What's the point? I, I need to be within my own system, not only because the academy judges me by that, but also emotionally, intellectually, what would I gain by reading outside the system, outside the discipline? Um, and I think to some extent, that's a shame. That is a real shame. So we've got a couple comments. I'll, I'll just bring them up uh, onto the to the screen if you, you should be able to read them. Uh, mm -hmm. So Aaron, uh, who I know has a podcast with you on it, so you can listen Hi, to that Aaron. podcast. Uh, he's asked about this question of terrain. And as we think now about contemporary societies, uh, particularly after generations of migration and integration, do we see a similar dynamic of Christians and Muslims constantly learning to think differently and express themselves that we might have seen uh, in the classical periods, or are there some distinctions that we have? Um, I don't know if you want to respond to that. I, I suppose the word terrain is however you define it. The, you know, you can come into this encounter with all kinds of ways of actually engaging dialogically. And I think for a lot of people, the, the most interesting aspect or the most puzzling aspect is, well, if you're not giving me a solution, if you're not giving me an end result, if you're not giving me a commonality, what's the point? Yep. And I think that that's not what thinking is. It doesn't have to have a conclusion at the end. Um, and it's not also about expression. I mean, you can be still very conservative or very liberal, whatever you want to be, but you can still be changed by what you read. So your faith can still be the way you practice it. I mean, you know, if, if someone said to me, well, did you, what did you stop doing or what did you start doing in terms of practice of faith? Well, I can't think of much ch that changed. But if somebody says, how did your attitude change to what you read and how you think about other things and the deeper philosophical questions, that changed a lot. Um, simply because you realize quite paradoxically, that the best thinkers are asking the same questions, but from different angles. And the best thinkers are also leaving those questions largely unanswered. So they may pave a way for you, whether you're Muslim or Christian, but they're not saying in a kind of dogmatic way. And I think for me, that's really the beauty of it, that how then do we create something following on in that tradition of writing and thinking about these questions in a way that leaves people with thinking, oh, I'd like to know more, I'd like to read more, someone outside my own religious tradition, rather than thinking that religious tradition has nothing to offer me. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly for me, I, I, I've told the story before, I, I wasn't intending to do Christian Muslim relations, I was gonna be a proper systematic theologian. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but it was the the encounters and terrain that I was living in, uh, first in Atlanta, Georgia, working with people who had re recently been resettled uh, as refugees from Iraq and Egypt and Sudan, and then living in the Middle East for a number of years, that I found myself, even as a Bardian who seems to have a suspicion of experience, being addressed and asked questions by my Muslim friends and neighbors. Um, and it's interesting because much of Christian theology has been an attempt to answer questions that are put to us by Greek philosophy, by Kant, by science. Um, and yet with Islam, we often think of sort of evading those questions or, or same with Judaism. So I think there is a sense in which the, the context allows us to have those questions, those inquiries put to us in a way that uh, is quite natural to engage. But as you were saying, there's, there's a sense in which um, many Christian theologians, and I think Muslims as well, sort of demarcate between what is religious and therefore doesn't need to be answered because mm -hmm. it's coming from a Christian or a Muslim and what is secular or scientific mm -hmm. and then needs to be addressed. But um, that's some ways an arbitrary category. If a Muslim mm -hmm. asks me a question, how do you account for, let's say, the cross? Um, why is it that that, that that question can simply be evaded? Uh, but if another Christian asks it, I have to give an account. So I think one of the, the things dialogically is to simply say, I'm taking uh, either m living Muslims or, or Muslim texts dead as seriously, yeah, yeah, dead Muslims, as <laughs> seriously as an intellectual challenge as I do, whether that's Hegel or Kant or, uh, or others. Um, uh, that leads us to uh, another question who's coming from one of our PhD students, uh, Samuel, uh, who talks about the ways in which debates about God are either a unifying point or a basis for working towards a better humanity. Um, what do you think lies beyond this? I think this was particularly when we were talking about the focus on solution, mm -hmm. where often God is invoked, uh, whether through Nostra Aetate or through ethics, uh, as this sort of building block to engage. Uh, I, I mean, that's a really interesting question, Sam. And I think to some extent, how you think of God affects how you think of society, your neighbors, your family, your relatives. But on the other hand, when I wrote the kind of semi-autobiographical work, the hardest chapter was reflections on God. What does God mean to you? Because it sounds awful, but most of the time we're not thinking about God in that kind of systematic way. We're thinking of belief, we're thinking of protection, we're thinking of prayer, but to, to, to write about God is a huge risk and, and a very humbling experience. I think you can do it in an intellectual way though, which is to say that what have Christians and Muslims said about God in their own tradition, both systematically and dogmatically and doctrinally, and then take it from there rather than, well, we believe in one God because we know that even oneness is disputed. And how does one think of oneness? It all depends on the kind of conversation you have. Not everybody has to have, you know, in a way, Joshua and I are privileged because we're not living in a, in a society where if we differ, then lives are at stake. But if we live in a society where lives are at stake because of Christian Muslim conflict, then I think the moral imperative is to, 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 to still have these intellectual conversations, but also to have God as a unifying force. Um, you know, there's no point in being intellectual if, as a result of it, people are dying all around you. Um, so I think that if you're looking in the academy and as an intellectual discussion, there is so much there, there is so much rich material as to how both Muslims within their own tradition have disputed over what God means, and both within the Christian faith as well, never mind dialogically. Um, but I... You know, but I think that's actually one of the most interesting areas. Um, how does one talk of God within the two traditions? Yeah, uh, I was actually literally writing about this uh, for an uh, overdue publication uh, right before this conversation. I think one of the things that I try to distinguish between is are we invoking we all believe in the same God or we all believe in Abraham as this sort of theological platform that uh, eliminates dialogue and conversation, or is it a shared framework of mutual learning and contestation? Because I don't think the tradition has agreed on one God or Abraham in, in a way that can be a platform to build, but is it a framework that 
allows for us to learn about one another, to enhance our own accounts, to clarify what we mean. Uh, and there has been in the history of the Christian, Muslim, and Jewish traditions a whole host of ways, both intentionally and accidentally, where each tradition has learned from the other. Obviously, David Burrell's work on Ibn Sinna, on Maimonides, on Thomas Aquinas uh, are examples of that. But there's a whole host of, of other ways in which uh, reflections might nuance this. On that point, uh, Muhammad uh, Gamal Abdul Noor, uh, recent PhD from, from SOAS as well as from Al Azhar, uh, has a question about uh, what you were saying earlier about God's transcendence. Um, is there some ways in which these different conceptualizations of God are are at work in this moment? Vague question, Muhammad. Yes. <laughs> um, no, I don't know that we can argue that the Muslim emphasis on transcendentalism was as a result of what you call Christian humanization. A lot of Christians would resist that, that, um, that it's not about humanizing God. Incarnation is not about the hum humanizing God. Um, in that sense, I think there was a lot of um, intra-Muslim discussion itself as to what does transcendent, transcendence mean? Um, how noble is God? Um, and I think, you know, where Sunni Islam generally has fallen is somewhere between, well, we can't really know God in his fullness, but we kind of know something about God. Um, I think the, the problem for me, though, is that at least in Sunni Islam, there's a tendency to almost act as if you know, as if we know everything about what God has said. And that is, and that creeps into Islamic law and the way we talk about law and ethics, which is reducing all the things that are left unanswered, whether it's in scripture, whether it's in the early tradition, to answers that this is the only way to be. And that I often argue that for a lot of Muslims, Islam's future lies in its past, that the further back you go, the closer you are to the true image of God, but also the true way of being Muslim. Um, and I'm not sure either philosophically or as a living reality that really works, um, because I think conversations about God were far richer in the 12th, 13th century. 10 to 12, 10 to 13th century than they are now, where there's a sense that we know everything there is to know. All we need to do is obey. Um, but, you know, the, the point about transcend, uh, imminence and transcendence is also interesting because Muslims have also wrestled with how do we, how do we experience God? If God is completely transcendent, if God is not touched not all Muslims say that, of course, we know that. But if God is not touched by what we do or is not affected by what we do, how do we experience God? And that is also something that a lot of people still wrestle with, even though the kind of orthodoxy has come down on the side of saying that we can only know God through obedience. but We can't really know the essence of God. Yeah, and, and similarly, in the Christian tradition, you have a long apophatic tradition that says even if even when God is given in Jesus, we still don't know the fullness mm -hmm. of God. There's this sense of mystery. So it's not simply because Jesus is incarnate that that we've collapsed the imminence and transcendence mm -hmm. debate. These are longstanding debates within the Christian tradition. And uh, Muhammad, as you know, you know, with debates about is God Falk, is the does God have a course C? These are all parts of the Islamic tradition of how do we make sense of divine revelation on the one hand, but also account for the fact that God isn't an object of our scrutiny, that God is that God exceeds all of that. I'm aware we're getting close to the end of time. I've got a number of other questions. Uh, one is a point of clarification of someone who is actually at your Gifford lectures, Baxter McCorleston. Okay. Oh, yes. Hi, Baxter. Uh, uh, when he was asking about this notion of cheap grace that you referenced uh, and its comparison with Qutb, uh, do you have any recollection of this, or do you expand on this more in your in your I Gifford will lecture? On that. Just wait for the book. I will expand on that. But I think that is one of the most attractive aspects of Bonhoeffer. How does one think of cheap grace in an Islamic context? I'm not sure if I have succeeded in explaining that parallel in the book, but I think 
both of them were really talking about to to really believe in God, to really have a faith, you need to take the risk. You need to be out there. You need to pay a price for that. Uh, both did it in very different ways, though, and I don't mean about their own execution, in what they were asking from their followers or from the, their faith communities. But I think that, for me, that was one of the, 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 the phrases that really attracted me to how can I think of that in, in, in the Qutub context. And then uh, we've got another question coming from uh, Victoria Turner, who's doing a PhD in World Christianity at Edinburgh. You guys could just ask us in, in person if we ever can see each other again. Uh, she's asking about what are the relate what's the relationship between let's say comparative religion and comparative theology. I know that uh, that's not exactly how either of us locates our work, but mm -hmm. what's the difference between engaging from a perspective or a grounding in a tradition and a more religious studies uh, model? How how might you think about the differences in that? Thanks for that. I don't actually think I do think of it like that. Um, it's, it's really hard to put into words how you do your work, if I can be as blunt as that. You kind of feel certain things and you have a tradition, but when I'm reading and writing, I'm not, you know, if I'm reading a Muslim text of any sort, I can immediately relate to so many things because it's a lived reality for me as well. However intellectual it might be, I still know because I've heard things, I've experienced things, I've read things. If I'm reading a Christian text, I can still relate to some of it because a vocabulary will translate to some extent, but I don't have the lived reality of that. I only have what my colleagues or my friends tell me. I don't see that as necessarily an issue, but I, but I can't distance myself from my faith. I can try and detach myself, but I'm always in it to some extent. The challenge is that we neither of us are preachers. I mean, I think Josh would make a really good preacher, but he's not a preacher. Neither of us are preachers in that sense. But you can't you can't locate yourself out of your faith either completely. I think it's almost impossible. Um, only if you're completely disillusioned with some aspect of it. But I don't think neither of us are at that point yet. So yeah. I, it, it, it's not religious studies in the sense that I, I'm, I'm, I am still treating it as an academic discipline. But I'm not just looking at what people do and observe. I also feel some of it as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a sense in which uh, critical studies of religion, religious studies can be extremely helpful um, in making sure that one understands the text, the practices on their own terms without me trying to bring my own, uh, it's often been thought, liberal Christianity or Christianity, uh, especially a Protestant vein that I am, has uh, negatively impacted how we interpret, read, uh, Islamic practices, other practices. So there's a sense in which I want to uh, recognize that and engage that. But on the other hand, I think um, I think it's uh, Robert Ori talks about um, sort of ontological and metaphysical pluralism uh, as a as a mode of religious studies that you really want to take the person's ideas and practices seriously. And insofar as um, whatever my own religious uh, tradition is, I know what it means. Um, having grown up uh, uh, in the Christian tradition and still being a Protestant, I know what it means to to have this sense of a text or a God or a tradition claim you. And rather than that being something that uh, hinders my ability to engage with, in my case, Muslims, I hope it allows me to open mm -hmm. up and understand, even if I don't take the Quran as my forkan, I don't take the prophet as my prophet. I know what it means um, both intellectually, but also um, as a human to engage that. Um, I'm aware that we're uh, coming to the end of time, even though we still have uh, a number of comments um, uh, to get to. Just a, a brief a brief comment from, from Reza Akbari, who's coming to us from Iran, a philosopher of religion, uh, to, to our earlier question, which is to say that much of our language of God is um, analogical or metaphoric. And so we use these terms, um, say the, the term father, uh, which Christians do or have used uh, to God. It's come under critique within the Christian tradition, but also from the Islamic tradition. What do we mean by this? Um, and that we have to attend to the ways in which language works, which I think is something that um, he wants to draw us attention to. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I just think, you know, when we were talking earlier about some of these comments, um, just to add that that in. Um, so one final comment coming from the United States, um, David Mo, uh, wondering if you could say something about the difference between comparative theology and theologies of religion, or if those are even categories you, you would apply to your own work. To be absolutely blunt, David, I probably wouldn't, um, because, because I don't, I mean, I'm sure some people would say, but what you're doing is comparative. I, I don't know, because I I don't think it's a discipline that's well defined. Um, and anyone who engages in any other religious tradition is called a comparativist, because the, dis the academy needs to define us all the time. Um, one of the chapters in the forthcoming book is on Rilke and Ghazali. Rilke is by no means a theologian, but he talks about God a lot. He's a poet. Why did I choose him? For no reason other than I really enjoyed his work. If I was a strict comparativist, I would have chosen somebody who was nearer Ghazali's time frame. Uh, you know, the, the rationale for comparing the two would be much clearer. I think I've made up a lot of things as I've gone along, simply because I've been interested in them. And But, you know, no one stopped me. And theology of religions, comparative theology, I still think that these phrases and these definitions are loaded. There's a sense that they have to be saying something good and 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 almost conclusive about why one does comparative work in the first place. And I'm not necessarily interested in saying something conclusive. I'm just interested in, interested in how do people relate? How can I relate? And how can I make interesting conversations come together in my work? Great. That's a, a fantastic way to end. Um, so if you haven't had the chance already, um, Mona's previous work, um, The Good Muslim, uh, Hospitality in Islam, uh, Christians, Muslims, and Jesus are all readily available to purchase. And we look forward to the book coming out with Cambridge at the end of this year or early next. Uh, please join us in the next few weeks. We've got conversations coming up with Dr. Bashir Saida of the University of Stirling, uh, with Professor Hugh Goddard of the University of Edinburgh, and Professor Jerusha Tanner Rhodes of Union Seminary. If there's other people that you'd like to hear from, do be in touch. Uh, and thank you, Mona, again uh, for you, joining Mishra. us. I hope we meet again soon in person. Yeah, one, one day. You Thanks. owe me a few. Thanks very much. <laughs> Take care. Thanks. Bye.